Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show, where ordinary heroes tell extraordinary stories during unique and never been heard before conversations with your host, Hillary Arno Burns. Hillary's unique listening and way of asking questions results in conversations that aren't usually talked about. So you can create the life that you really want, but are afraid you can't really have. We are demonstrating the greatness and the human spirit in creating a world where we all reclaim our birthright of joy, happiness, purpose, and passion. Now, here's your host, Hilary Arno Burns. Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show. And today we have a very special guest. Today we have Heather Schapter, who is the executive director of Crossroads International. And before I bring Heather on, we're going to watch a short video from Crossroads International. Girls are empowered. Girls are uncut diamonds. Girls are powerful. I've learned that as girls, we need to have a place, we need to be known. You have to show yourself out to the world, you need to be strong. a eu beaucoup d'impact sur nos jeunes. Ça nous a permis de renforcer nos capacités sur la santé de la reproduction, de maîtriser tout sujet qui est lié à la santé de la reproduction, par exemple. Il y a eu diminution de grossesse précoce, de mariage d'enfants, de mutilation génitale féminine. Et aussi, nos parents ont arrêté de prendre ces sujets comme des sujets tabous. L'impact que Dame Kam a fait sur ma communauté est que dès son arrivée, il y a beaucoup de choses qui ont commencé à changer. Avant, nous les jeunes, nous avons des problèmes, nous les voyons, mais on ne savait pas quoi faire. Et Dame Kam nous les a éclaircis et il nous sensibilise surtout. Mais maintenant, je suis une porte-parole de ma communauté grâce à Dame Kam. Je suis la présidente du club de jeunes filles à Fongole. Le projet de Dame Kam a contribué à la diminution de beaucoup de fléaux, comme l'abandon scolaire les grossesses et mariages précoces. Dans le club, j'ai appris beaucoup de choses. J'ai appris les règles d'hygiène menstruelle, l'importance de se soutenir entre filles. J'arrive à, discu à discuter sur des sujets qui étaient autrefois tabous avec mes parents. Mes espoirs pour l'avenir, pour moi, ma communauté, est que les droits des enfants, et des filles et des femmes soient respectés. Et que les violences faites aux femmes et aux filles soient bannies. I want to be a journalist because I can bring the brief news on TV. I want to be a lawyer in my future. I want to become a gynecologist because I want to help the female reproductive system. I want to be a nurse because I want to help sick people in the future. Okay, we are ready to bring Heather to the stage. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here. Great to be with you. Yes, yeah, so that was an incredible video. Um, we do want to talk about, we will talk about Crossroads. We also want to talk about you and how you got there. Um, so I'm going to let you start us off with what you think would give us um, an understanding of why you, why, why are you working there? What, why does that call to you? Mm, thank you. I think from a really young age, I just had this thing that I'd like to end poverty and, you know, 
not really for any good reason. It's not like I had to be the one to be involved, but it just really called to me. And there is an aspect of diverse culture. So it was a particular, I'm really interested in and see it completely possible to not have poverty on the planet. And in particular, where poverty is the most dire. So not necessarily looking in North America or Europe, and I don't mean to say there aren't challenges as well, but really looking to see where there's the greatest poverty on the planet, which also happens to be where there's incredible diversity. So I was really interested in the diversity of cultures and perspectives. Now, when you say at a young age, what what age are you talking about? But I started my first non-government, like my first charity, you know, like that. So just, so at least from when I was 17. Wait, 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 wait. When you were 17, you started your own charity? Yes. Yeah. I started my own charity. So at least from that time, and that was a charity that was founded in volunteerism. Uh, just a simple idea. There were, there were teens and of course I was a teen too, but there were teens that were, you know, kind of getting into trouble, you know, in, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the summer, you know, when they didn't have school and they had incredible dancing talents. <laughs> they really liked to dance, you know, music, dance, like that. And so, uh, you know, there were a lot of senior citizens homes where, uh, where I was living. And so we thought, and, you know, they didn't have a lot of people visiting them. So we organized the teens to do dance routines and come and visit the seniors. And then that turned into, you know, crafts. And anyway, they all fell in love with each other. And um, and 10 years later, that thing was still going. I can remember I got a call in a completely different part of the world saying, we're having a reunion of, it was called Helping Hands Volunteens. Uh, would you like to join us? And they had no idea that I founded it. <laughs> what, so what, like, Okay, when I was a teenager, I was out, you know, driving you around looking those for guys. Teens. I was, I wasn't, no, I was a good girl okay. and I got good grades and I did all my homework, but we still were driving around looking for guys. I wasn't thinking about starting a charity. Like how, right. yeah. how did that happen to come across your mind? Like, you know, or it just did. You know, I think, you know, I, I grew up in, uh, Newfoundland, so it's the most easterly province in, in Canada. And, you know, the culture is really, mm, people really take care of each other. It's just a really taking care of. And, um, you know, my mom was a huge volunteer. She was the provincial commissioner for Girl Guides of Canada. And uh, I think it was just really inculcated in the family and in the culture to be of service so really it was just kind of the water literally yeah. you know like wow. sw swimming in so and like it was totally joyous it was like it wasn't like a hardship it was like i i love this i love making a difference and like that and did, were you one of the dancers too yes madonna oh. i think it was papa don't preach <laughs> was it really that was one of the songs yeah Oh, how fun. No, that yeah. makes sense. No, but because I didn't grow up with, you know, I wouldn't have thought of it because I, but, you know, again, my family wasn't doing that. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I can yeah. remember when I was, this goes way back, right? So, um, when I was in kindergarten. Um, so, at that time, the Vietnamese refugees, so this is during the Vietnam War, they were, you know, some refugees were coming to Canada, perhaps other places, but, um, and there was a Vietnamese refugee in our class and Mrs. Stead, our kindergarten teacher, you know, when it was time to, you know, go to the washroom, uh, she said, Heather, can you take, you know, um, the Vietnamese refugee, could you take her to the washroom? It's what you did, right? You went in twos always. Yeah. And, uh, I said, of course. And so I can still remember she opened the stall door. And instead of, you know, sitting down, uh, she jumped and she squat. Right. And I said, where are you from? That is awesome. <laughs> right. That 
that she's different, right? As in she's from a different place. So that's kind of the fascination from a young age with the diversity piece. Oh, that was kindergarten. Wow. Yeah. So you, that's, that's so interesting, right? That it started so young. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So you started a charity at 17, like most 17 year old, just kidding. Um, (laughs) That's no, a that's cool amazing. Thing, to what? What'd you say? That's a cool thing to create. Yes. Like most wow. 17 year olds. Yeah. Well, Newfoundland, you said you take care of each other. Do you think that's all over Canada? Because I don't necessarily, I mean, I guess there would be pockets of it here. I'm in Connecticut, USA. Um, sure. yeah. You know, churches do. So yeah. I, I wouldn't say nobody does, but do you yeah. think that's all over Canada or just particular to there? Yeah, I mean, I think similarly, there'd be pockets, you know, in every province, you know, for sure. Um, And I think at least Canadians would say that the Newfoundland culture in particular, you know, does stand out. And, you know, it might be from a history of a lot of hardship with the fishery. And, you know, there might be like, you have to pull together because it's difficult. It can be difficult or it used to be, you know, in the past. So, yeah. It does have a reputation of that kind of generosity. Like even my, my mother-in-law, you know, she, who's um, a Newfoundlander, um, you know, she will say to me, you know, she'll kind of lean in, you know, when we're in a conversation and she'll say, you know, there's a, there's a single mom down the street, Heather, and she will never want for anything. You know, that kind of a, Kind of a quiet, no one makes a big deal out of it. Mm. Just it's just what people do. Wow. That's so cool. We, I was just uh in my office, we were talking about how when COVID started, how some people, you know, bought all the toilet paper and they were just being so selfish, you know, <laughs> as opposed to 9-11, which brought people together mm-hmm. and so wonderful, you know. So it's interesting that, you know. The different cultures, I guess. And I know we're going to talk about culture today. So, okay. All right. So you, so you started a charity and then where did you go after that? Um, So eventually, you know, I thought, okay, so if, if I'm going to have some go really at ending poverty, Mm -hmm. um, I thought, I don't think it's with the charitable sector alone that's going to have that happen. So after my undergrad degree, I got a master's in business because I thought, you know, the business sector kind of runs the planet. I mean that in the best way, you know, like it, it, it has a lot to do with, with every society. And if we were ever going to scale the most effective poverty ending programs, I think we really need to partner with the business sector. So no, so I just I'm stuck on something. Sure. What I mean, you talked about the diversity and you talked about the charity you started. Where did the poverty part come in that you wanted to end poverty? Were you like how did yeah, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. I just had it like it was just something that didn't need to be. And how did you know about poverty? Like did you see it? Like where well, did you know? Yeah, it wasn't, you know, we were, I would say, kind of lower middle class income wise, but um, I would say in Newfoundland at that time, at least, you didn't see, right, the face of poverty because people were taking care of each other and people certainly had, you know, challenges, but you wouldn't see it, you know, on the street like you might today, right? It's like homelessness. But it was just a, um, you know, I'm not sure kind of what the, visibility was globally Mm -hmm. except for the odd glimpses of those who were in St. John's who were from other places. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that their places where they came from were necessarily poor. I just knew there was an opportunity. There was like a condition globally that didn't need to be. And these people were fascinating and their cultures were fascinating. So, you know, let's get her done, you know, like that. Wow. So it just, it seems like it just got you in the heart. 
for some just reason. Got right? me in the heart, and uh, yeah, was, and just like this is so doable, which I still have, you know, so so doable. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So you went, and what did you study undergrad? Um, psychology. It's like an arts degree. Yeah. So okay. So psychology, and then you you part. Okay. So then you partnered it with business. Okay. Yeah. And then where did you go after that? Um, so I actually, I started in the private sector, um, and you know, it was great cause you know, where else could you go to have a, you know, a wonderfully male dominated experience in the private sector. So, you know, I started in the railway. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, marketing in the railway, uh, and it was an extraordinary experience and, uh, it took me about six months to realize wow, this is really not a fit, not about the male dominated piece, but the private sector piece. Mm. And uh, I had a, uh, a female supervisor, female boss, who was such a role model, she was diminutive, you know, petite. And she was so respected and so powerful. And I went to her and I said, after about six months, I said, thank you so much. Like, this is such a great opportunity to be here. And I'm out to end poverty. <laughs> right? I can't believe still that I, t I said that. And um, would you be willing to let me work here part time? And could I use your fax machine to fax out my resume and cover letters to not-for-profit ending poverty employers and she said yes so it took me at least six months maybe longer i worked part-time i used the fax machine like that so that was the first gig kind of in the in the private sector like that wow yeah what was that like? Did you plan to say it or it just came out or like, that's amazing, right? That you it took were... a lot of courage, but I knew who yeah. she was. And she okay. said, I'm for you to have your dreams fulfilled. So, I mean, that's, and that, that's what I now say to my employees, some of whom Crossroads is not a fit. And I will say, and they'll often stay in the sector or, you know, open their own business. And I will say, wow. I am for your dreams fulfilled. Yeah. So now, were, after, you, mm -hmm. were you doing any personal development work or anything like that at that time that you got the courage? That was before that time. Yeah. Um, you know, I was always, because psychology was my undergrad, so I was very interested in motivation and, you know, just how people think and mm -hmm. operate. So um, certainly lots of reading, but that was before I had done the landmark form in 2001. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know what, when I was young, I had, I think I had more courage. Um, yeah. you know, I didn't really think things, not that I didn't think them through, but I, I wasn't as afraid as I got yeah. later. Like, exactly. You know, yeah. yeah. It was my first job. Like, so I was like, what could, you know? <laughs> Yeah. What do I have to lose in a way? Right. Right? So that's amazing. I knew, okay. I knew she was great. I knew she was great. That's uh, what a great boss. Okay. Whew. Yeah. All right. So then, so then it took you six months and you got a not for profit job. Yeah, exactly. So from then on, I, uh, you know, worked with, you know, some of the kind of the best and the biggest, you know, in the field of ending poverty with, again, a focus uh, on women and girls. Mm. Yeah. And, and then, so I did that for many years. Um, and then including, I got to uh, work and live in Bangladesh and work with the largest non-governmental organization on the planet. They were then 25 years ago, and they still are. Uh, they're called BRAC, B-R-A-C. Yeah. And I can just share a short story about that. Um, the the founder who's passed now, um, his vision, end of poverty through the empowerment of women. Now that was, that's 30 years ago in Bangladesh. So, you know, Bangladesh then and was right. 
it's a, a heavily hierarchical um, and, you know, male dominated. And that was his stand. So one of the examples was um, Brack wanted to put in place what's called sericulture and aquaculture programs. So the sericulture is the making of silk from the worms because they also had a huge clothing business. So the saris, right? All of the beautiful clothing. Oh. Um, and then aquaculture, fish farming. So he started out these enormous programs. And just to give you an idea, a single program would reach oh. two, 2 million women. Was he from there or was he from here? He's Bangla. He was Bangladeshi. Yeah. Okay. And he yeah. knew that's so amazing, right? That he saw that women were the, they were you know? the, the present and the future. And, and just to say that he, he, he's starting these two technical large scale programs, but he only wanted to have women work there. Well, how could you do that? So, cause they didn't have any education in those two areas. So, you know what he did? He created a Harvard model university so that women could be trained in sericulture and aquaculture as an example of the kind of work that they do. So I got to work with that incredible man and that incredible organization. And what was your role there? What was that? Was, that, was the university already up or were you creating it or what? I wasn't involved in the university. So what I was doing was um, decentralizing, kind of putting more in the hands of the women, new businesses that they could start up. Wow. So there were still like the starting of new businesses was still mostly top down in the organization, just kind of endemic of the, the culture. So with my partners there at BRAC, I said, well, what about could we engage the women more directly in what businesses they think they could start? And most of the women were illiterate, um, but we found a way with them. And I have to tell you, Hillary, when, when I would meet with the women and with my colleagues, right, at BRAC, they were just so gobsmacked that someone asked them what they thought, hmm. you know, like that. And so then we kind of train them like on five fingers, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you know if a business has a good shot, right? So we would train them on, you know, uses local materials. Oh, okay. It looks like we can actually bring in more money than spend, you know, like that kind of thing. And BRAC went from starting about 10 businesses, small businesses every year to 10 every single month because of the women and, you know, so just they're really empowered. So that was the work I got to do. We started with 10,000 women. It was spread to the 2 million women that were being served by the, the organization. Wow. And how long were you there? A little over two years. That's incredible. 10 and a year, 10 a month. Wow. Emmy, just in case there's any Bangladeshi fabulous people listening, Emmy Ektu Bagla Bolti Pari. <laughs> which is I can speak a little bangle. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. 10 a year to 10 a month. How long did that take? Was that in the two years or was that? Yeah. 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 That was in the two years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And the businesses were successful and they thrived. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and not all of them, of course, but they yeah. had a far greater startup and then success rate because Brack's amazing. So, so yeah, that was Bangladesh and Haiti and, and uh, different, I lived in Haiti as well. And uh, so different places. And then I worked in the tech sector. So just to say kind of the next phase for me was, I saw really great programs around the world. BRAC is a, one of the many examples, but very few programs or initiatives are scaled, mm -hmm. like really scaled. And I thought maybe one of the leverage points could be technology. So I worked with a global tech firm and I headed up their non-governmental division to see how could we scale some of the best programs around economic empowerment for women 
in the Middle East and North Africa. And then I would say had kind of medium success. There was some failure around having investors fund kind of that initial phase where you need to do the investment, you know, in the technology to get it going. Mm -hmm. yeah. What, like what kind of technology? Like, so you were still helping them start businesses or, or is this a different thing? So this would be helping organizations that had really good training programs on how to start your business, how to be successful in your business again for, uh, you know, women in, you know, really low income areas and then how to have technology. Cause a lot of that would be still in person, Hillary, right? So there's a real mm -hmm. limit then to the number. So how could technology support that? Okay. So that was way before COVID, right? So it was new even to look at, uh, you know, could, could people use a tablet? You know, how could we connect through the internet? Even most of these women would not have access to the right. internet. So you were trying to scale training them to start businesses, the scaling of the training. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that, and then, and then I had my own leadership company looking to see how could, how could I empower the leaders in organizations that were ending poverty so they could be more effective. So I did that for a decade as well. Whoa. Yeah. While you were doing the other stuff or, or, or is this the next thing for 10? That was the next thing. Yeah. And oh. then from, from that, then I had the idea, I, you know, what, what, what would it be like? Maybe, maybe I could lead my own, like that doesn't have to be my organization, but maybe I could lead a whole organization, maybe like that. And then I started to speak that and share that. And then that. And is this, yeah, is this, is Crossroads the first one that you've been leading? It or is. Were you, yeah, wow. exactly. So I've only ever led like departments or, okay. you know, a division. I've never led a whole organization. So it's the first time. And how do you like it? I, I love it. It's a complete joy, you know, and there's, there's things I notice that aren't my strengths. I would say, you know, like I would say on the admin side, it's not something mm -hmm. I wake up and like, I can't wait to fill out a form, you know, that kind of thing. And, and there's some <laughs> forms to fill out or things to approve. Um, and it's magnificent. And I can't wait every single day to mm. be with my team and um, grow and expand and, you know, make the difference we, we get to make. Wow. That's so cool. Okay. Ooh, it's amazing the progression, right? From starting your, from jumping on the toilet seat to right. starting a charity, right? All that, and here you are. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Crossroads, sure. right? I think it's time. What? I know when we talk, there's a lot you guys are doing and the, the countries, you know, what, what do you want to, where do you want to start with that? Sure, sure, sure. So maybe the vision, right? So everything we do yeah. is for, you know, uh, this vision. So it's, it's one world. So we have a vision of like one world and it's a world that is without poverty. So that's not present. And then it's a world where the rights of women and girls are fulfilled. So that's kind of always the beacon for everything we do. Um, the organization has been around 65 years and I can perhaps say in a minute about the kind of how it got started. And we are in, um, 11 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so that's where we operate. Um, and we operate with and through partners in Africa. So our approach is local partners. They are the best place to say what are the community priorities and what, what does the community need to fulfill on those priorities? 
Now they're not employees of you, right? You just that's right. They're they, they have their own employee structures, exactly. Yeah. So they we partner with them. They'll say, here are our priorities. Here's what we need. Crossroads in terms of you know them being more effective, and then we get them primarily you know skilled volunteers to fulfill on that. Okay, so skilled volunteers, and do you also give them funding or no? And we it give is- some, and we give some funding. It's a smaller part of what we do, which I happen to like because, you know, sometimes there can be a dependency that gets created for any of us, right, who are receiving money um, from other sources. So uh, there is some some seed funding, um, but it's primarily around we call it capacity strengthening. Some People think of it as training, whereas, mm-hmm. you know, whereas someone comes and is alongside an existing wow. staff or, you know, group of people so that when they leave, that capacity is strengthened and it's left, right? It's, wow. it's yeah, it's intact. Yeah. That's amazing. So you're bringing them the skilled volunteers that have obviously a skill. Yeah. that they're going to impart in these places and then leave. And there it is. And there it is. Yeah. And is it okay to say how it all started? Yeah. Yeah. We have two minutes to the commercial. We can, you oh. want to take the commercial now? Let's Sounds- take the commercial now. And then, then I don't have to interrupt you. Okay. Sounds- yeah. So we will be right back after a message from our sponsors. Has social emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bring Kikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Do you ever feel like you can't say what you really want to say? Or that you're stuck or in a holding pattern in your relationships, career, personal life, or finances? Are there things you want in life that you've given up on? Are you resigned that this is as good as it's going to get? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Hillary Burns, host of the Getting Real with Hillary show, has the solution you need. Hillary is a published author of three books and has a program called The Getting Real Process. This process frees you from what is holding you back, allowing you to create a life you love. Don't believe it? It is hard to believe that it could work, isn't it? The proof is that hundreds of Hillary's clients have used The Getting Real Process and are now free to create whatever they want in relationships, career, finances, enjoying life, or just loving themselves more. So go to realtalkwithhillary.com and order Hillary's book, Real Talk, and set up a conversation. And thank you, as always, to our sponsor, KokoriApp.com. If you'd like to bring experiential social emotional learning to your schools, to your teams, to your businesses, please go to kokoriapp.com and schedule a a chat and see if this is a fit for you. Also, um, if you would like to partner, my commitment is that we elevate the conversation and consciousness of the planet. I'm looking for partners, um, people who want to advertise, people who want to sponsor the show, please uh, reach out to me at Hillary at gettingrealwithhillary.com and let's have a conversation and let's elevate the consciousness of the world together. And welcome back, Heather Schachter. Thank you. Yay. All right. Do you want to start with 
I know you were saying you had a story about how um, Crossroads was started. Yeah. Um, do you want to start yeah, there? Yeah, let me okay. share that because it, it speaks to the values of the organization. So, so in 1958, there was a gentleman by the name of Reverend Dr. James Robinson based in the United States. And Reverend Dr. James Robinson thought that if he could possibly send American volunteers to Africa during the civil rights movement, those Americans certainly might provide something of value to the Africans, but he was really more interested in the new perspectives and even new views of the world that they would return with that could really provide a new future for the civil rights movement. Wow. So, you know, I was thinking when you first told me that, that it was like in the forties or fifties, but the civil rights were the sixties. Right. right. Yeah. Right. And the, exactly. Yeah. And it seems like, so how many years? That's 60 years so ago. 65. Oh so that's, it, that's yeah. scary. And so that, right. that's the piece about the, the American kind of start. And then um, what I really love about it is, it's that equality piece, right? It doesn't mean that we're better than, right? It's just that it's just the diversity of perspective that provides something else, a new view. And then there's a small group. Yeah. And so how, I mean, I'm wondering how did his brain come up with that, but how, if he's, if, if they saw these other places where there wasn't equality, they would bring that back here and go, whoa, is that, am I missing it? Well, you know, I don't know exactly, but what I think, and certainly what our volunteers, you know, tell us over and over again today, it's just like, you know, when you go and you see that, wow, they kind of, you know, they don't eat meatloaf on Tuesday, you know, it's like they just do things really differently. So it's just that, that opening up of, wow, there's like, There's different people in the world. I mean, we're all, you know, so similar in ways, but so it's a a different perspective that, that as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, we do it this way. Oh my God, there's another way to do it. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, just seeing, wow, like these people who look so different, look how much love they have in their family or, you know, like, like that. So so I really love the diverse, again, it's the diversity, right? And diversity of cultures. Yeah. No one is better than, it's not like that. It's just, there's a diversity of perspective. So that was the U.S. This is Canada. So there was a small group of uh, individuals close to the border, um, U.S.-Canada border, and they were so inspired but by what they were having these volunteers share that they uh, collected, and this is 65 years ago, uh, $5,000, and they offered it to Reverend Dr. James Robinson for his initiatives. And he said, thank you, but really how you could best support me is to please start your own crossroads in Canada. So that's how that was started uh, 65 years ago in a place called London, Ontario. And less than a month ago, we returned to that place for the first ever 65 years of volunteering impact, a celebration of Mm. volunteers and the volunteering movement. And the founder of Crossroads spoke and so many of those part of that original setting up, raising funds, really speaking to the value and the impact volunteers could have, um, that we all got together with new volunteers as well, just to celebrate each other and for them to be acknowledged for what they started. Wow. So was that was the Canadian founder yeah. or the original? It was the Canadian founder, Reverend Dr. James Robinson. He's passed away some time ago. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. So tell us, yeah, tell us like what kind of stuff are you guys doing? Like I know we covered some of it. Um, what would be some of your best successes? I know you said you had some good stories. Sure, and maybe I can speak to what's in the video. 
as well. So yeah, the video is looking at uh, some of our girls empowerment programs. So um, those are places that are, they're kind of like extracurricular clubs that are in schools. And of course, many girls are not in school. So we also have programs that provide access to those girls. Um, but it's a safe space where girls can come together and learn actually about the, the rights of their bodies. And what we have seen is the incidence of then child marriage is going down in many of these countries. Um, and as well in the video, there are some pictures of some tablets. So we are uh, using technology. Um, I talked earlier about the opportunities to have technology scale some great programs. So we have these mobile learning labs. So girls are learning on their tablets about uh, the rights of their bodies, the importance of education. Um, and so 33% now, um, there's a 33% um, reduction um, of girls dropping out of school um, because they're learning about these rights. They're, they now know they have a right not to be married at 12, things like that. And the other thing, um, Hillary, just kind of, it links all of, to all of this, is um, what we call menstrual poverty. So it's a really key piece so that girls get educated on um, when they menstruate, um, they can find, um, uh, they're in, now in many places, they can um, find access to reusable sanitary pads, reusable. Because mm. um, wow. many families can't afford to use them or buy them, girls miss out a week every month out of school and then they drop out, right? Because they're too far behind, like that, right? So mm -hmm. menstrual poverty. So those are key areas, ending child marriage, um, you know, really educating girls and then providing access to their families to the reusable sanitary pads um, and then really supporting them to st the staying in school, right, is the key mm. to breaking the cycle in their families. Now, okay, this is a question I had um, after our conversation yesterday. So they, they have a certain culture of this, let's say child marriage, and I know we discussed the uh, genital mutilation, mutilation yeah. right? But that's part of their culture. I mean, how, I mean, one could say, hey, who the hell, who are you to change that? You know, how it did, or is it the partners that are bringing you in that are asking that? You know what I'm saying? Like if something's so ingrained, how do you, how do you, how did they welcome you to change it? That's what I was wondering. How did that happen? Yeah, that's it. And who knew that this was wrong? You know what I mean? Like, who knew? Who was aware to bring you in? Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, you said it. It's it's the partners, right? So so all the partners were, that we're working with, it's their goal also to have equality for women and girls. So they are the ones who, you know, we we select them, right? But then they come to us and say, these are the biggest barriers to having girls stay in school. Their parents can't afford sanitary pads like that. Mm -hmm. And so we're the, you know, kind of background support. We're not the ones going to the, you know, religious leaders. We're not the ones going to the politicians, to the government. It's the, it's the partners. And are they females or males or both? They're both. Yeah, they're both. both. And uh, primarily female headed um, and but men as well. So there is a movement. Absolutely. I mean, many and many men also really yeah. see that these wow. practices do not empower women there. And there isn't anything from them about it. It's just 
where there's still resistance. I mean, the example of the, um, you know, the menstruation, for example, right? So um, Crossroads, we work in, in Senegal, so in, in West Africa, and I was there recently. And our Senegalese team, uh, many of whom are men, I have never talked so much about menstruation in my whole life. <laughs> They're like, okay, so here are the issues with girls and menstruation and here's what we're doing and here are the sanitary pads and here's the reusable part and here's how we're getting the supplies. So there, right, there's, I mean, I came home to my sons and my husband saying, I think we need to talk about menstruation, <laughs> right? So, so there are really some, you know, extraordinary voices of men that are, you know, leading the way, which is really great because it'll, it sometimes takes that given there's still such a lack of equality for women voices. Yeah. And how, like, you know, when you're just like in your little fishbowl, right. You don't know that there's anything else, right. Like when, when the, the Reverend took people there, they saw, Oh, they do it differently. Like someone had to have, open their eyes that there's another way, you know, and then now they're behind it and they're bringing, I mean, it's, it's really incredible, right? It, it's incredible. There's a, um, there's a young woman leader in Tanzania and she's a lawyer and she came and spoke at our international day of the girl. So the United Nations has an international day of the girl and Crossroads has a flagship awareness and fundraising event. It's in, in person um in toronto and so we sometimes have these special speakers so um rebecca jumi so she came in 2019 before covid so um i had met her two months before in tanzania and she told us that she had been to court her organization and she was fighting for marriage, the age of marriage for girls to be the same as the age of marriage for boys at 18. So it, it was not, okay, it was not. So when we met her in August, she was just finishing up at the Court of Appeal. So it already been through once and now she was at the Court of Appeal. And she was telling us, here are the, you know, the, the four arguments that the Tanzanian government has against child marriage for girls being the same age. And, you know, I said to her, so what are you going to do if you lose? And she looked at me kind of like, you know, like, I, like kind of like, what kind of a silly question is, you know, <laughs> that's how I heard right, it. Right. And she goes, well, we'll just keep going, you know, like that. So to give me an idea of kind of the leadership, right, that we have. So by the time when she came and she spoke for International Day of the Girl, um, she told us that the Court of Appeal had overturned 100% of the Tanzanian government's arguments. And now today, the Tanzanian child marriage age is the same for girls as it is for Wow. Wow. Now, what what were their reasons not to do it? Do you remember? I don't remember. And they, but they were when I heard them, they were they they were valid, you know, taking care of. Right. Wanting to make sure the girls are taken care of like that. Oh, okay. So, again, not a like being in their shoes could completely get it. And there's a stand for something else for the equality piece. So that's what's possible. Wow. And, and so, so they were married. I mean, just to understand why like people would get married, you know, at 10 or 12, I know we were talking a little yesterday, but um, they would be living in a household and be taken care of. Right. That's because their families couldn't. Is, yeah, like, I mean, what, that's, what kind the, that's kind of the window dressing. Right. So. OK. So families that economically couldn't take care of so many children. 
less likely that the girls could have gained full employment, perhaps as much as the boys. Again, I'm talking in really, you know, traditional yeah. uh, sociocultural situations. So please, let's have the girls be taken care of and then be married off. Now, of course, we know the horror um, that, you know, often ensues with very young girls um, being married off into, you know, terribly abusive uh, situation. Yeah. So that's what the partners and crossroads, you know, were, were out to transform and it's happening. Good. Wow. Yeah. So these empowerment clubs are really, did the families get, yeah. The, the families get money for it with the dowry often. Or... often so that's sometimes part of the yeah. practice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So with the empowerment, these girls are seeing, Oh, I don't have to do that. They are, and where do those tablets come from? Is that from your organization? It is, yes. Yeah. So that's, you asked about sometimes is there funding involved? So, yeah. yeah. So that's through, again, the generous donation of some uh, individual donors and some foundations that we were able to provide those, which is really great. Wow. And, and what I will say is when I was there, the municipality now, you know, in some of these areas, they're putting in money from their own budgets. And that's really the key to sustainability, right, is the the local governments are seeing the initiatives are really transformative that they're putting in their own budget. That's what we want to see. Right. And who developed the training? Did you guys do that or did they do it locally? A combination of, yeah. So we have some experts in house. I mentioned, of course, you know, skilled volunteers. So this would be one of the key ways where skilled volunteers would lend their expertise, work with the local partners, and I think that's one of the great examples of that whole diversity piece, right? Of course, local partners know how do you communicate that? What are the key priorities and what are the key needs? But there's some really great knowledge, tools, and insights, you know, from outside of the local areas that we want to bring in from the World Health Organization and from other sources. So to bring all that together, I think that's really where you get the, the magic and the possibility that it will stick. Yeah. And the syner synergy, synergy, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah, that's so great, right? That people work together. Yeah. <laughs> right? Totally, yeah. It's really beautiful, yeah. Wow. Okay, so let's see. We got, we have a, like, well, we got six, say five minutes left. So what other stories can you tell us so people can get really a feel, you know, for more. I mean, that's incredible what you just talked about. And then we want to be able to, you know, tell people what you're looking for, how they find you, how they can, you know, we were talking about volunteering anywhere. Yeah, um, thank you. Well, maybe we can, I can say a little bit about what the volunteer opportunities are and just kind of how that, how that works. Right. So, um, so again, our 60 partners in Africa, all working towards a vision of one world, the rights of women and girls fulfilled in those areas, they will say, hey, Crossroads, we need, and I'm just going to kind of share some of the areas and then how it works. So so they might need support in some of the, the functions like, like accounting, you know, if you're a project manager or maybe you're a communications, like you love communications. So maybe it's in those areas. Um, there's actually fundraising we see more and more requests from our partners because they want to be able to mobilize their own resources. So that's a whole world there. And then the other area would be directly related to the programs that those partners are running. So I talked about a lawyer. So, you know, having a legal support expertise in that area, Hillary, one of the ones that's coming up more and more is, uh, psychosocial support. So um, we're getting more and more requests, um, even as our partners and the women and girls they serve are really having mental well-being issues. So we get a lot of that. Um, experts, agronomists, so many of our partners and women in particular, and some adolescent girls, they're farmers. So um, if there can be volunteers in those areas, uh, monitoring and evaluation. So there's a whole realm, uh, income, anything around entrepreneurship, all of those are really valued skills. 
Okay, so let's say I'm a volunteer. I say, yep, me, I want to, I don't even know what I would do, but. Communications. Let's say, let's say communications. What do you say? Communications. Okay, communications, Podcasts, good. Yeah. yeah, so let's say I say, oh, I want to volunteer. Then what? what does it look like so that people know what they're signing up for? Yeah, so it looks kind of like a structured job. Like you've got a mandate, you'd have a job description, all of your costs would be covered. You would get, you know, an orientation. Uh, then you would be going to one of the 11 countries in Africa and you'd be there from the shortest mandate is two weeks in terms of effectiveness. And there'd usually be quite a bit of communication with the partner up front, two weeks, mm -hmm. six months, and then the longest is a year. Wow. Yeah. Now, if I, let's say I have a job, I mean, this is not pay. You're not getting a salary, but you are getting your expenses. You're not pay. out of pocket. How, exactly. Yeah. Right. So how do people, they just take a leave of absence from their job or maybe they're in between jobs. Exactly. Yeah. So the average age of volunteer uh, with Crossroads is 34. So that's the situation. Now we do have some volunteers who do remote volunteer assignments. So you know, how you, you know, you're just saying, well, I have a job, so how could I, so we do have that. And some of our sister organizations, so there's others like us in Canada, they do that a little bit more than we do. So far, we have found the best way to engage remote volunteers is when they've already gone to the partner. And then, you know, the relationship is really lovely. And then the remote piece, the remote assistance support collaboration is more effective. We would love to explore that more, especially for skilled volunteers with different abilities, including, you know, disabilities, they could engage and would like to engage more. So if that's of interest to anyone, they could also be in touch with us. Okay. And how, so we got like about a minute sure. left. I want to make sure people know how to reach you yeah. and what you want to leave, like what your vision is for the world, for your organization, let's say five years from now, what would be like, the best thing ever mm. that you could imagine. Mm, thanks for the question. So maybe I'll just get my email. So uh, and yeah. if there's a way to put that on the screen after, but Heather, first name, yeah. at C I N like November, T like Tango, L like Lima, dot org, C I N T gallery. Yeah. So that's the best way to reach me. And I think, I mean, what I'd like to leave people with is to be engaged, you know, in one of three ways, volunteer with Crossroads or in your local community, advocate for rights, for equality, for whatever you see might be missing. Um, and then to donate either financially or some of your other gifts. So volunteer advocate and donate a world with people engaged in one or all of those three ways, I think would be a really great one world. Hmm. I love that. One world. Imagine there would only be peace. Right. There'd be no reason to have anything other than peace. And I would even put in love. Right. Right. Wow. Well, thank you. Have there anything real quick in closing mm -hmm. or thanks for the opportunity. And, uh, thanks to all the women and girls and, boys and men that we serve for their courage and boldness. We're here for them. Wow. Well, thank you, Heather, for, for who you are, for what you're doing for the world. It's just incredible. And thank you for your courage and just your stand for women and for the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode. I started getting real with Hillary when I discovered that I was a people pleasing, pleasant phony and wanted to be more of my real self. We can grow together. If you will like the show, subscribe to my channel and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can have a world that's more real.